All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, the International Spot, uh, Spot Coaching Framework, presented by uh, Professor Pat Duffy. Um, if I can just tell you a little bit about uh, today's webinar and what you can expect. Um, it's due to last for, the presentation itself is due to last for about uh, 45 minutes and it will be followed by um, a question and answer session at the end of around 15 minutes. It may, it may go on a bit longer depending on the volume of questions that we have. The, if you could just change the slide for me, Pat. Um, you will... Uh, receive uh, an email telling you when the recording uh, will be available. That will normally be in a couple of days' time, uh, may even be earlier than that, um, and that will be there along with the slides so you can uh, review and look at the slides um, at a later date. If you do have questions, um, please type them in the questions box at the bottom. I'll be monitoring them um, through, uh, throughout the webinar and uh, putting them into some sort of order and we'll be then putting them to pass at the end of the session. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about today's speaker. Um, we're delighted to welcome uh, Professor Pat Duffy um, and as you can see he uh, has enjoyed a wide and varied career and in addition to his current role as Professor of Sport Coaching at Leeds Metropolitan University in Leeds, he is in demand <coughs> Sorry as a speaker and presenter at conferences and events all over the world. Uh, he's also one of the principal architects and lead authors of the International Sport Coaching Framework, which, if you're not familiar with currently, uh, seeks to provide an internationally recognized reference for coaches across different sports and disciplines and forms the basis for today's webinar. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like now to hand you over to today's pre uh, presenter, Professor Pat Duffy. Thank you very much, Graham, and for not editing all those uh, lies that I sent, not lies, uh, those uh, descriptions. Uh, the check is in the post. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Graham, will I go straight into the presentation? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, what I'm going to outline during the presentation is uh, the process followed uh, in developing the International Sport Coaching Framework, um, how the framework itself may be applied to uh, different contexts and situations, um, and some of its key features and some implementation issues which we've begun to address, uh, including uh, future developments and as Graham mentioned at the outset, I'll be delighted to respond to any questions that are posted. So firstly, the process to develop the International Sport Coaching Framework, shortened here to ISCS. Um, the important thing to understand here is that this has been a document which has been derived out of a partnership process which invo has involved a number of organizations, some of whom are listed here. Uh, the key drivers, I suppose, in the first instance were the International Council for Coaching Excellence, the ICCE, the o Association of Summer Olympic International Federations, ASWAF, and uh, very much facilitated uh, by my own university, Leeds Metropolitan University. Um, so they are the agencies that have been involved in a partnership which has led to the production of the document. And uh, I think it's a fair question to ask, why do we need an international sport coaching framework? And as Graham has already alluded to, it has been developed uh, as an internationally recognized reference point for the development of coaches. Um, uh, and in so doing, it is designed to be responsive to the needs of different sports, countries, organizations, and institutions, uh, and thus provides benchmarks for the recognition uh, and certification of coaches. So you can see that it's strongly rooted in 
uh, the development of coaches and, and uh, a point of reference uh, on how that process uh, might operate and how a common language might be applied across different sports and countries so that issues around recognition and certification can be more clearly communicated and understood. Um, while the uh, ver latest version of the framework was published at the Global Coaching Conference in Durban, South Africa in September 2013, uh, its um, origins extend well before that. Um, between 1999 and 2007, the European arm of the ICCE, the European Coaching Council, uh, worked on a five-level structure uh, for the rec recognition of coaching qualifications and competence through a European Union-funded project, which was known as the AESIS project, which was coordinated by the Sport University uh, in Cologne and the European Network of Sport Science Education and Employment. This process led to the adoption of a convention among 33 different organizations in Europe, universities, national organizations, uh, lead coach organizations in different contexts, whether in countries or international federations, uh, which became known as the Rio Maior Convention, as it was signed uh, at a, a European Network of Sports, Science, Education and Employment Conference which was held uh, in Rio Maior, Portugal in 2007. Now, following on from the Rio Maior Convention, many European countries and organizations began to use the European document as a point of reference, and feedback uh, emerged to the effect that there was a need for a similar document and, and a reference point in a global context. And out of, in the first instance, informal discussions between ICCE and the Summer Olympic Federations, ASWAF, uh, it was agreed to establish a project group for the period 2011 to 2013. And this uh, project group was jointly chaired by myself and by Marisol Casado, who is the president of the International Triathlon Federation a member of the International Olympic Committee. And uh, between us, we had the responsibility of chairing the process, leading to the first publication of the framework as a version 1.1 at the Olympic Games in London. Uh, that was um, released at the Global Coaches House, which was staged by ICC at the Olympic Games in London in 2012. So this is what the working group looked like. Uh, you can see that it was uh, a multi-agency group where with the joint chair from ICC and ASWAF, that was Marisol and myself, you then had different organizations, key organizations across the global sporting and coaching landscapes, for, in the, for instance, Olympic Solidarity, the Entourage Commission of the International Olympic Committee. ASWAF nominated a number of uh, representatives from their constituent international federations. Um, uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, also um, uh, was involved in the group. The ICC ensured that it had a representative from each of its five continental subdivisions. Uh, and then uh, we had the benefit of having extensive advisory and technical support through the various researchers. Three of them are, are shown here. Uh, on the photograph on the left is Cliff Mallet from Australia, Pierre Trudeau from Canada, and Jean Cote from Canada also. Uh, these three gentlemen and indeed many of their fellow researchers were hugely helpful 
in collating the information necessary to put this document uh, together. Uh, you can also see there on the left-hand side some of the logos of, for example, the World Equestrian Federation, World Rowing, the IAAF, uh, the World Hockey Federation, FIH, the International Tennis Federation, uh, the International Sailing Federation, the International Rugby Board. These uh, world federations were uh, very um, important uh, partners in the development of the document. Uh, they obviously brought a perspective from the international federations generally, but in each case they had progressed uh, in their own sport some very important work which helped to inform how a global reference point might articulate with sport-specific systems, be they at the national or international level. Key national organizations there on the top right hand side. You can see the Coaching Association of Canada and of course the ICC President uh, John Bales uh, has served a, a long term tenure as President of the CAC and that organization has been very influential in moving this work forward. Um, uh, and. I suppose that interaction not just with international federations and researchers, but with national entities has been very significant. You can see there, for instance, the Australian uh, government through the Australian Sport Commission, uh, INSEP in Paris, which is uh, the uh, lead French organization in relation to coach education and development, the Trainer Academy in Cologne in Germany. And SASCOC, the South African South African Sport uh, Confederation and Olympic Committee, uh, was also very strongly involved in the work. In fact, South Africa, during the course of the developmental work, became the first national body to apply the recommendations uh, and the benchmarks from the International Sport Coaching Framework to um, a national need. need. They produce a, a, a very extensive document called uh, South African LPCD, Long-Term Coach Development, which uh, referenced itself against the ISCS. So um, they are the uh, main bodies involved in the working group, uh, many others might I say, but this will give you a sense of uh, just how um, wide-ranging the process was and the number of agencies involved. Now, now the road to Durban, this refers to how we actually got to Durban last September with version 1.2 ready for publication and of course uh, a key partner uh, in all of this uh, were the uh, now uh, long-term publications partners of the ICC, Human Kinetics. And Human Kinetics uh, took uh, charge of um, the preparation of the document uh, for South Africa. Uh, and of course, in the information that will be uh, circulated following uh, this webinar, the various links to the document and the Human Kinetics site uh, are available. And um, while we include a lot of the detail in today's webinar, um, I think it is important to uh, to point out that there's quite a bit of detail in that document, which particularly if you're involved in considering how the reference point can be applied to your own situation, uh, I think it's well advised to look closely uh, at, that, um, uh, at that document. So um, what are the applications of the framework? Uh, firstly, it's, it's uh, uh, aimed at doing what hopefully today's webinar, uh, webinar is adding to stimulating 
Global Exchange on Coaching, Coach Education, Coach Development and Qualification. Um, it should provide uh, a basis upon which existing programs can be evaluated and improved. Uh, and it will provide a reference in relation to coach education and development programs, hopefully helping to enhance the quality of those programs. And in addition to that, it provides, and this is something where our researchers have been very helpful, it provides the basis upon which uh, further research and evaluation might take place. And indeed, at the national, national governing body, international federation, and international levels, um, it provides a clear basis and set of terms which relate to coaching and the development of coaches, which hopefully can assist in uh, the making of decisions uh, which will further advance the development of coach education and development. Now, the key features of the framework, uh, they're listed as follows. Firstly, we came up with the definition of coaching and the idea here being that we felt we needed um, all on the same page in terms of what we were speaking about. And the definition is shown here. Uh, refers to sport coaching being a process of guided improvement and development in a single sport and at identifiable stages of athlete development. Short definition, and we're quite pleased we've managed to keep it quite short, uh, but you will see that there are a number of key words there. Uh, it is a process of guided improvement, uh, so it's not in just m one moment, it actually occurs over a period of time, and hence the word development, in a single sport. So we're highlighting the significance of sports, whether it's at the national or international level, as delivery vehicles uh, for, for the, the, the different disciplines. But of course, coaching is central to delivery in a sport-specific way. And then the final feature of that definition highlighting that it is focused on the different stages of athlete development. Now, uh, that final nuance is very important as we begin to look at some of the other terms uh, that are outlined um, in the rest of the presentation. One of the key things that has been solidified in the document is that while within the ICC and other organizations for a long time, we have been speaking about coaching as a profession. Based on more recent discussions and analysis, we're now beginning to speak more of coaching as a blended professional area, where there is a recognition that many of those who are involved in coaching, whether it's uh, uh, in, in community, regional, and, and even national levels. Many are operating on a volunteer, unpaid basis. But there are many uh, who uh, earn a full-time living. They're full-time paid coaches. And others are part-time paid coaches. And one of the cases that's made in the framework is that uh, within each sport and each country uh, what this uh, set of COGS looks like will be different because the proportion of volunteers, part-time paid and full-time paid coaches uh, will differ. But you will see from the arrows on the diagram that it is intended that there should be interaction between these different coaching status categories. Um, and again, that's further explained in the document. Now going back to my earlier point about the definition of coaching, I did say that we had linked the definition to single sports and to stage of athlete development. And so 
referring to the seminal work of the likes of Istvan Bali and Jean Cote, we began to look at what the participant pathway looks like, whether it's uh, on the participation strand or indeed the performance strand. And so we've identified a number of coaching categories, two main coaching categories, participation coaching and performance coaching, and then within that, uh, three domains of coaching uh, relating to each category. So uh, within the participation coaching category, you have the domains of coaching children, coaching adolescents, and coaching adults. And within performance coaching, you have coaching emerging athletes, coaching performance uh, athletes, and particularly emerging performance athletes, and then coaching high performance uh, athletes. So uh, the, the, the analysis of these categories and domains was a central part uh, of the document. And again, I would stress that how these categories and domains look uh, may well vary quite significantly from sport to sport and from country to country. So, for example, a sport that does not have a profile of a high engagement of young people and children uh, would not focus very strongly or would be unlikely to focus strongly on participation coaching, coaching of children, whereas sports which uh, have a high profile of involvement from adults would, of course, be looking at the uh, domain relating to uh, coaching adults. Now, one of the key demands which we received as we went through the development of the framework was for more clarity, not just in relation to these coaching categories, participation coaching and performance coaching, and the domains as listed uh, towards the top of this diagram. So the six domains, children, adolescents, adults, emerging athletes, performance athletes, and high performance athletes. But in addition to these uh, terms, the need to uh, develop or to clearly explain what are the primary functions that are carried out by coaches in their day-to-day -day jobs. Now, some earlier frameworks had defined the coach's role around the ability to plan, the ability to implement, and the ability to evaluate and reflect. And uh, that terminology is reflected in the framework. However, you will see that the primary functions have been grouped into six uh, main areas uh, as listed here, setting a vision and strategy, shaping the environment, building relationships, conducting practices, and preparing for competitions, reading and reacting to the field. The field here doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know, the field of play. It means the social and organizational and cultural environment within which the coach is operating and then uh, the ability of the coach to learn and reflect as he or she pursues uh, their job. So these, if you like, are primary functions which are then broken down into a series of competence statements about what a coach needs to be able to do effectively if they're going to carry out their, their overall role. And of course, the nature of these primary functions will vary depending on which coaching category the coach is working in, or indeed the level of seniority uh, or responsibility which is sought from the coach. So on the left-hand side, the, the green boxes show four main steps in terms of responsibility that have been defined, coaching assistant, coach, advanced or senior coach, or master or head coach. And then that's underpinned by uh, knowledge in three key areas as defined uh, by researchers internationally and particularly Jean Cote and Wade Gilbert, uh, professional knowledge uh, that is sport specific and related content and how you teach or coach that, interpersonal knowledge, how you connect with and interact with people, and intrapersonal knowledge which is around uh, self-awareness and reflection on the part of the coach. And you'll see that 
in the center of this diagram is the significance for every single coach to have their own exp expressed values, philosophy, and goals that guide actions. So you can probably gather from this diagram that notwithstanding the existence of a number of reference points around functions, categories, knowledge, uh, and roles, that this could be customized to uh, a coach working in almost any situation. Crucially, of course, the way in which it is applied to that coach's situation will be driven by the coach's view uh, of why they're coaching, what they're trying to achieve, what's their coaching philosophy, and what, go what kind of goals have they agreed with their employing organization and or the athletes uh, with whom they work. We have also recognized that the process of coach development is not simply a question of undertaking courses. And this slide is uh, generated from a recent chapter published by Jean Cote, a colleague of his, Carl Erickson, and myself, which looked uh, at uh, some recent research uh, of the experiential profile of head coaches in performance coaching. And there was a pretty common pattern going through here. But uh, not surprisingly, uh, experience in coaching uh, at the various steps that we outlined, whether it was assistant coach or senior coach and so forth, uh, were important in moving up the ladder in terms of responsibility. Uh, but that in the majority of this case, this was um, preceded by uh, athletic experience. Often uh, the future coach uh, as being above average as an athlete in a specific sport, and prior to that, often having played a variety of sports and indeed played a formal leadership role in some of those uh, situations. And then, uh, of course, these elements of experience strongly su supplemented by um, informal and formal education in a variety of ways. Now, this always was not your sport-specific coach education in some cases. They may have come through an education process, for example, as a teacher or in studying some subject which led them to become a graduate or indeed in sport and physical education. So again, quite an interesting blend in terms of how coaches go through their own process of long-term coach development, or LTCD, as we're beginning to, to call it. In addition to these main headings, one of the key things coming through in the consultation was that there is a need to more clearly recognize the importance of developing the coaches and that individuals, be they in federations or educational institutions or wherever, who are responsible for the formal or informal uh, of uh, development of coaches uh, coach developers, that they themselves uh, need some training and development. And, and this diagram shows how coach developers, advanced or senior coach developers, or master or head coach developers, uh, would sit relative to the different stages of coaching. And uh, of course, these people, it is recommended in the document that they would undertake training which would provide them with uh, the skills to facilitate coaches as, as adults in various situations, be they uh, informal scenarios where the coaches begin to learn from their own practice and experience, 
uh, they begin to work more closely with their other coaches in communities of practice, or indeed they come to workshops and or formal uh, coach education programs. Uh, the ICC, working closely with SASCOC, the South African Olympic Committee, has begun to develop a program and syllabus of how this coach developer uh, work begins to pan out. Uh, and indeed in South Africa, the levels out identified here have been applied uh, at uh, uh, federation, provincial, and national levels, uh, leading to uh, the identification of future master or head coach uh, developers. So you can see here what we're trying to do is not only build a strand of skilled personnel to assist coaches in their development, but also to create a more sustainable long-term structure where there are people available in a sport or a country who can assist with that development process. In addition to all of these uh, points of reference, we have begun to chart, uh, there's a much more extensive di di diagram on page 46 of the framework, which shows how the pathways, uh, whether they're at governing body level, national qualifications, frameworks, university le levels, how these different coaching roles as defined in the framework uh, with the appropriate training, how they might link with uh, different levels operating um, at federation, university, and so forth. But again, I emphasize, in each case, of course, each national, uh, each country, each national and international federation, each university uh, defines uh, the roles uh, and levels and indeed the education and qualification structures. Uh, which are which are uh, relevant uh, to to them. So Graham, can I just say at this point, uh, the slides seem to have gone through on my screen, and. Um, I, <clears throat> you actually have control of the the panel. I can maybe take it back from you. Yeah. Um, which uh, could you tell me the slide number we're at? Uh, I'm on the slide. Twenty two. Just bear with me a sec. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that's fine. That seems to have is that, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So it's with you, Graham. Can we go back to the previous slide? That one? Uh, yeah, so this was looking at implementation. And I think a key thing to recognize here is that for the purposes of implementation, the ISCF comes into its strongest uh, value when each sport federation, each national organization, international sport federation, or educational institution has done a clear analysis of which coaching occupations, roles, and domains are needed based on the athlete and participant population within a particular sport. From that then, of course, they begin to identify the coaching functions, competences, knowledge, and values. And then uh, the design of learning outcomes, programs, and assessment, the tools occurs, and these can be aligned with uh, national qualification systems and, where appropriate, international federation systems of uh, recognition. Uh, what the ISCF will do is it will provide some signposts and uh, guidance points to help educational institutions, federations, and other organizations work through that process. OK, that's that slide done, Graham. Yeah. Uh, 
So looking to the future, I think I've explained how we got to where we are, how version 1.1 was prepared for London 2012, version 1.2 was prepared for South Africa and launched in South Africa. We're going to continue with this developmental process and indeed uh, events like today's webinar are very, very important in terms of that further developmental cycle and we will further enhance and improve the framework to version 2.1 which will be published at the Global Coaches House in Rio de Janeiro 2016. So from there on there will be quadrennial updates provided of the framework. Yeah, that's it, Graham. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks, Pat. Uh, we, we have uh, received uh, a number of questions. We can always do with a few more if anyone uh, wants to submit them. We still have probably a little bit of time at the end. Um, <clears throat> they are actually coming in how thick and fast. So I'll start out with ones that came in a little bit earlier. Uh, the first one's from Paul Robbins uh, of the British Swimming Coaches Association, um, who asked what was the membership of the technical lead body that defined the coaching standards. Sorry, Graham, would you mind repeating the last Yeah, sure. He, he's uh, just asking uh, what was the membership of the technical lead body that defined the coaching standards. I'm assuming he just wants some sort of steer on um, on individuals. I know you, you gave um, there was a, a schematic of the makeup yeah. generally organisation yeah. by organisation. Yes, yeah, so the people involved in the steering group to develop the framework were drawn from the ICCE, the International Council for Coaching Excellence. So these would have been national leaders drawn from a num number of countries around the world, several from Europe, some from Australia, some from uh, countries uh, in, in Asia such as uh, China, uh, the United States, North America, um, and so on. And then in addition to that you had representatives from the international federations uh, through ASWAF and you had the researchers that are listed on that earlier slide, such as uh, Cliff Mallet, uh, Pierre Trudel, Trudel and Jean Cote. Okay. Um, Gold, uh, Jacob Goldbeck of ISCED um, asked if you could expand on the statement producing standards that are rigorous enough to allow movement between sports and from coach education into an ag academic program based on RPL. RPL. I think you may well have you may well have done that during the presentation. Yeah, well, of course, um, a key principle here is that the development and recognition uh, of coach education programs and the related qualifications is done at sports-specific educational institution, be they universities or other educational institutions and national contexts. And our aspiration through the ISCF is that uh, the, um, the benchmarks which are provided will provide uh, a more common language which can be used uh, against um, uh, different um, programs in different sports and so forth and uh, we've already received feedback to the, the point that institutions find these statements very useful in helping them to ascertain what the prior experience has been of coaches but of course each institution each country and so forth may well and indeed is entitled to seek further evidence uh, of um, that prior learning and experience. Okay, um, a very good question here from Sarah Pickford. It's in two parts. <clears throat> Uh, she says, there is evidence already that this framework can work in countries where, where there is a certain level of structure and good governance in place already, but how do you see this working in countries where they do not currently have any structured approach or accreditation system, or where certificates get given out like sweets? Could going, f good, 
could going from nothing to deliver coach training for those working with children through to the elite level be a step too far in the first instance? I think it's a great question because uh, a key message we're trying to get across is that the application of the framework actually must be context specific. We are not recommending that there's one solution for all sports and all countries. It must be based on the existing starting point in those countries and a clear analysis of what is needed for that context. And then, of course, the framework is there to provide the handrails necessary to put in place what kind of um, uh, development and qualification structure might be appropriate there. Now, having said that, the ICC and indeed uh, Leeds Met University have found that there is a very strong uh, and important demand for support in going through that process. And certainly our advice to any country or federation starting from an early stage may well wish to contact us with a view to what's the best determining what is the best place to start in response to the needs of their circumstances. We are not advocating that this uh, framework just simply be taken and applied in a blanket carte blanche way across uh, all range of contexts. And indeed, the, the question uh, referred to absence of infra infrastructure in some sports and countries. And we do see that as a challenge. There's quite a varied landscape in terms of uh, infrastructure for taking this kind of framework on board. Okay, um, Andrew DeChalis, I hope I got that right, from the University of Malta asks, um, uh, if you could tell him more about uh, adult people in coaching, sorry I've got that one wrong, um, he asks um, the higher education route, we're trying to award uh, at level three or four recognition to students finishing undergrad or master's degrees. How do you suggest we should go about it? Should we expect them to have also attained a higher level in coaching courses in a specific course? Um, well, if I could go back to the diagram which highlighted that the journey to becoming a head coach or a master coach will consist of a varied blend of athletic experience, coaching experience, formal and informal education. And that again will look different for each coach. So we are advocating to higher education institutions that the document could be used as a way in which the prior learning and experiences of coaches could be more clearly documented. Therefore, in response to Andrew's question, we are not specifically recommending that, for example, uh, senior or head coaches should have a degree level qualification. However, we are saying that the profile of competence and experience uh, would suggest that um, there may well be comparability between uh, the training programs which are offer, offered by higher education institutions and the requirements of those roles. But that is an issue to be determined by national and international federations and preferably uh, in close consultation with national organizations and universities who are working closely, closely within uh, any given sport. Okay, uh, there's a question here from Beirut who asks, could you tell me more about adult people in the coaching categories? Um, specific, specifically, what do you mean adult? What are their ages? 40, 50, 30, 25? Uh, and following, could, um, could you tell me more about volunteer coaches? Yeah, so the, the, in, in, in the participation coaching uh, category, we are talking about coaches who specifically work in involve, involving adults in participation in sport. So such coaches, for example, 
might work with uh, those who have left their teenage years, uh, but who have now entered their early 20s. And for example, perhaps their only aspiration in swimming might be to learn to swim. They don't want to be a competitive international swimmer, but clearly the participation coach uh, would have the function there of guiding the improvement to the point that that adult can learn to swim to a point where they will continue their engagement or participation within the sport. We also had uh, several representations to the effect that among the adult um, population, some do progress on a more performance-oriented pathway into master's level uh, competition. Uh, well, clearly, the coaches uh, working with those adult athletes would need to be equipped uh, to guide their improvement towards such master's level competition. I think you asked one then about there was a there was part of that question, Graham, around volunteer coaches, was it? Are you there, Graham? Okay. I'll, I'll uh, uh, yeah. Uh, could you tell me uh, ask more about volunteer coaches? Yeah, volunteer coaches relate to those people who coach but are not paid for their coaching. And we have found that uh, in many of the countries we um, consulted with, that there are high proportions of their coaching workforce are in this category. Uh, so, for example, in the UK, we drew on research which showed that over 80% of coaches in the coaching workforce were in fact volunteers. Similar recent research in South Africa also pointed to a high level of volunteering in coaching. And indeed feedback received from many of the Eastern European uh, countries uh, also uh, indicated that there is an emerging culture in those countries where coaches are giving freely of their time uh, to coach in any of the categories that we've outlined in, in the document. Okay, uh, Catherine Cartias, in defining coaches, uh, coaching, why did they de decide to focus on single sports and was this a topic of much discussion? Yes, it was a topic of a lot of uh, discussion. Um, the view which we took was that the organization and delivery of sport nationally and internationally uh, is organ around, organized around sport specific units, be they clubs or federations, national, international federations, and that the uh, development, deployment, quality assurance and so forth of coaches and coaching is often done on a sport-specific basis. Now, having said that, going back to this concept of coaching as a blended profession, we have found that there are, of course, coaches who coach in more than one sport. But, of course, if they coach in more than one sport, the definition of their role, their core functions, the coaching domains, and so forth, needs to take place for that a particular sport. Um, so we felt it was a more applied methodology for um, coming up with a set of descriptors which was relevant to the actual frontline delivery context for coaching, but that that could occur in a single sport or a multi-sport context. Uh, Claudio Mantovani asks, is there any good practice at national level about cooperation between higher education, i.e. university, and sport, uh, sport coach education uh, in a federation system? Yes, the examples of this uh, are increasing. Um, you know, we did, we, we, we have come across some very good examples which we can, we can, we'll be very happy to provide offline, but in the forthcoming issue, or in a forthcoming issue of the International Sport Coaching Journal, a recent initiative in the UK 
which is drawing together a platform of higher education institutions to collaborate with national and international federations using the framework as a reference point. There will be an explanatory article in the journal, certainly within the next couple of months, but uh, we'll be happy to provide more specific uh, examples to Claudio and others as required. Apologies to uh, Jean McArdle because that was in fact her question. Fernando, uh, Fernando Rocha asked, um, what about the relation between the coach competence and the athlete development phase? Do you think that better qualification should be in, in the oldest development phases? Could you repeat the last part, Graham, please? Uh, do you think that better qualifications should be part of the oldest development phases? better qualification. Hmm. Well, our view actually is that uh, the functions and competences of the coaches should be very closely aligned with the needs and stage and development of the athlete. So whether it's with children, emerging athletes, high performance athletes, and so forth, um, the competence and knowledge of the coach uh, needs to match those requirements. So we have not made any judgments to the effect that the better qualified coaches should be working with coaches or with athletes or whatever. Indeed, on the contrary, this frame framework is very clear in moving away from a direct link between qualification level and the performance level at which uh, you are working. Uh, in fact, we're saying that we need equally well experienced and qualified coaches working with children as we do with our Olympic or Paralympic athletes. Um, <clears throat> Catherine Cartier said, at the level of children's coaching, why are the participation and performance coaching pathways distinct? Surely emerging athletes may come through participation coaching. Yes, it was for that reason we added that as an additional domain. Um, some of those entering, particularly the teenage years, uh, will be identified in their context as emerging talented sports people. Uh, and our view is that there's a very important set of competences, knowledge, expertise required by coaches to nurture and develop uh, this talent. But equally, uh, there are many challenges involved in retaining uh, adolescents uh, in sport. And, and so the development of uh, these, uh, the relevant skills and competences among uh, a group of participation coaches in uh, that age range we see as being very important, thus providing the basis for the, the two strands of the pathway. And indeed, in response to Catherine's question, here may well be an example where a coach might choose to uh, deepen their knowledge, competence, and uh, the functional areas in relation to both, category, both categories, both participation and performance. Uh, Phil Muras, I wonder if the framework development considered the work of the likes of Chris Cushton and Keith David uh, in conceiving coaching as a complex process. We've done very extensive reviews of literature uh, in the UK and internationally, so short answer to that is yes, and um, I didn't dwell on it in, in the presentation. But the social, organizational, and contextual positioning of coaching is very definitely addressed uh, within uh, the document. So yes, the short answer is yes, we have done so. Uh, John Erskine asks, um, is it surprising to you that to date universities in the UK at least have focused on high performance coaching at the expense of other coaching domains in terms of educational qualifications for coaches? Um, I don't think it's surprising in that that is probably the trend that we have seen globally in relation to the education and development of, of and indeed recognition of coaches. As I mentioned earlier, 
the framework very explicitly moves away from the view that the only area we should be looking at are uh, is around the coaches of performance uh, and high performance athletes. Uh, so it is not surprising to us that educational institutions and indeed federations and others have focused on the area of high performance. Uh, drivers such as professional sport, Olympic Games, Paralympic Games and so forth have obviously been influential there because uh, there has been more of a market for coaches who have qualifications, many of them who go on to take on part-time or full-time paid roles in those areas. So there has been an element of market forces at work there. So it's not surprising. What I can say is that we've been pleasantly surprised by the level of engagement from federations, national and international, and higher education institutions in discussing what is the uh, the best or optimal way of looking at the education and development of coaches to meet participant need, be they children, uh, participation, adults, adolescents, or indeed emerging uh, high performance or high performance athletes. And uh, just time for one more question. It actually comes from me. Um, I'm sure many people uh, would have looked at uh, today's presentation um, and the ICCE. Um, I just wonder, the membership of the ICC is open to coaching organizations and individuals, but what are the requirements and procedures for gaining membership and how would an individual or an organization go about it? Yeah, the origins of the organization, Graham, are that it, it formed in the late 90s as a result of informal engagement between national coach education agencies such as the Canadian Coaches Association. Uh, at the time I was director of the National Coaching Training Centre in Ireland and I was involved in the process. Sports Coach UK here in the UK, INSEP Trainer Academy, uh, the Wingate Institute in Israel and others. So they came together institutionally really to exchange ideas and best practice. So the membership structure of the ICC now reflects this that national organizations who are responsible for coach education uh, may register as members. Uh, we call it a membership. They're recognized as national, national members. But equally, educational institutions involved in uh, coach education, uh, individuals who have an interest in, in this work may also register as, individual, as individuals. We've recently relocated our office to the UK, based here at Leeds Metropolitan University. And Karen Livingston, uh, as the officer, the, the, the global coaching office manager, is the contact point for uh, membership. And uh, you can access Karen through our website, uh, www.icce.ws. Great. Well, um, thanks very much for that, Pat. Um, there may be one or two questions that we still um, haven't answered. I apologize for that, but I will pass them on to you in the hope that you can probably look at them yourself later. Um, just um, a, sort of an ad break now before we finish up. Um, we've, Human Kinetics um, has recently in, uh, uh, published the International Sport Coaching Framework um, journal, uh, sorry, the uh, the book. Um, it's available um, online from, from Human Kinetics at uh, the ridiculously low price of six ninety nine. dollars um, And if uh, you're actually a member of our loyalty scheme, you get 20% off that as well. So it's well, well I'm sure um, for that price, a lot of you will be interested in looking at the fuller version of what uh, Pat has been talking about today. Um, Additionally, uh, there is a new journal, uh, the International Sport Coaching Journal, of which um, Pat is very much a leading light. I think uh, editor, is that correct? Or certainly on the yes, editorial board. Editor, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, ICC members uh, receive uh, a substantial uh, discount on their uh, uh, membership uh, of 60% uh, if they take out a subscription. So again, that is something, um, the, the launch issue is out now. Um, and that, again, uh, can be accessed through the Human Kinetics uh, website. Um, finally, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, I'm 
pretty sure that everyone uh, would uh, like to thank Pat for what uh, was an inspiring, informative presentation. Um, well, before uh, we actually finish, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, to uh, conduct a small survey. Uh, we do we do appreciate if you do take the few minutes it takes. It's only like five questions, multiple choice, um, but it does help us. Uh, the feedback does help us to improve our webinars. Um, the webinar has been recorded. It will be made available um, through a number of sources, including the Human Kinetics website, uh, GoToWebinar, and the ICCE website, and you will receive. Um, emails telling you when and where that's available. Um, I'd finally just like to say thank you to, us all, to you all for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of the day and I hope uh, that you'll be able to join us at some time in the future. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>